Welcome back, everyone. We're here today with our Training Thursday episode of the week. Just can't get away from these fitness-based shows, exercise-based shows. Uh, Love that our community is interested in hearing about how movement, natural human movement, and exercise fits into the equation about living a longer, healthier, better quality of life. So today we're going to tie in how to customize your workout programs based on your hormones. So this is especially going to be geared to those people maybe with higher levels of testosterone, higher levels of cortisol, and maybe even what's called estrogen dominance. This can go for both men and women. So men on the higher side of testosterone, men on the higher side of cortisol, men on the higher side of estrogen conversion, women, same exact thing, especially when with women with PCOS or even lower levels of thyroid. So all of this ties together. And the reason how it happens is this, when we are adding exercise to our lifestyle, which by the way, everybody should do, and it should just be customized based on your needs, meaning there is no one size fits all. Uh, We do so much lab testing that we can look at this at a little bit of a deeper level. It doesn't mean that any exercise expert out there is wrong in their recommendations. The problem is they can be wrong in the recommendation per person that they're saying it to. So let me give you an example. When I went overseas to do all of my internships for my doctoral studies, I did that for a reason. And the reason is I planned on being able to come back after about, well, I can tell you exactly how many hours it was. It was 2,375 hours uh, of internship hours. And I knew by, by the end of that, that I would be able to just say, this is the best form of natural medicine. I've seen it work now all over the world, and um, and I lived it. You know, I literally was there. I breathed it, and it worked great. Well, you know, that was my goal, right? So I was naive. I um, I just expected that I was going to be able to find the one because I was going to be studying in India and Sri Lanka, and I was going to be studying in China. I was going to be studying in Europe, and I was going to be studying all over the United States. I was in Chicago. I don't even know where else I was. I was all over. And lo and behold, I knew almost immediately that there is no one best form of medicine. So again, I studied bioregulatory medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, traditional naturopathy, uh, functional medicine, uh, all different forms, herbalism, you name it. So, and they're all amazing. They really are. And there's even a time and place again for conventional medicine. There's a time and place for everything. The problem is that no one form of medicine works for every individual and every circumstance. And that's why when you use a truly integrative approach where you can combine all of them, except the pharmaceutical part, you always refer out to your PCP or whatever endocrinologist, whatever ologist you need, then you're gonna be able to help every single person all of the time. So when people always ask, have you ever helped with someone with this or with that or with this? And the answer is yes. And the reason is that we don't have a system of medicine that defines you as an individual in your diseases. We look at underlying root causes, and then we help from there. So let's bring that back now full circle. There is no one recommendation, exercise recommendation for every human alive. Ayurveda is the most complete form of medicine. You could make an argument that that can help all of the people all the time. The problem is it could take a long time to help that person. And the reason is that you don't always know, you don't always know based on assessments exactly what's going on with the individual. And again, I love Ayurveda. I'm a huge proponent of naturopathy. I'm a huge proponent of Ayurveda. However, as my mentor taught me, who learned from Dr. Vasant Lad, like literally, when I look at it, it's just amazing. Like Dr. Vasant Lad came to the US, my mentor wrote the textbooks for him, meaning it's his words, taught in classes, she translated, she wrote it down, wrote those textbooks, she taught me. I mean, it's absolutely amazing that I had the privilege of, of being able to have a mentor like that. But here's the thing: as amazing as Ayurveda is, you can figure out it, you can figure out the root cause faster with at-home lab testing. So that's where you know functional medicine um, or modern day, you know, naturopathic medicine really comes in. That's that's the ideal. Because then you can use your Ayurvedic principles. Again, you're just trying to get there faster. The goal is to help the end person, right? So always like have this debate with other doctors. L- listen, what are we trying to do here? Are we arguing over what's the best form of medicine? Like, are we really gonna do that? That's that's what we're doing here. Because I thought the goal was to help the patient, right? or the wellness client in natural medicine, right? That's the goal. So is the goal an ego battle or is the goal to help people? 
Because sometimes when you're talking with other doctors or practitioners or other people, I can't figure out the goal. I don't know if they're trying to just elevate themselves or their form of medicine, or they're trying to help the end of an individual. So in my goal, again, I won't be here forever. Neither will any one of us. My goal is to help push forward what we know works. So now when we're talking about, let's just take PCOS, when you have PCOS, there, and I'm going to go through this, so definitely stay with me on the podcast the next few weeks. I'll go through PCOS. There's, there, essentially, they're narrowing it down to four different forms of PCOS. Um, they're looking at how the gut and certain bacteria, which are too low, are um, aided in PCOS, meaning like not in a good way, vitamin D. I'll go through those studies. I think they're pretty fantastic. I mean, I, again, this is why I love Ayurveda. Love TCM, love bioregulatory medicine, love all the older forms, traditional naturopathy, but also I love modern day science, right? We can use both. We don't have to um, choose what's the only form of medicine we're going to use. So let me get into the topic at hand now. If we're defining PCOS, and again, you can find out what type of PCOS you have. It's, it's actually very, very easy. Again, this is where you take the guesswork out of it. So with PCOS, you either have high testosterone, you might have high DHEA, you might have high cortisol, you might have high estrogen or at least estrogen dominance, which is typically um, calibrated by having low progesterone. You might have low vitamin D, you might have gut issues, you might have low thyroid. Okay, so like, and usually you're going to have high levels of inflammation for, for various other reasons. Well, you can literally test all of those things except for gut function with one lab, like literally one lab. Um, you can run it with any naturopathic doctor that you want. You can run it with an integrative health practitioner level two. So again, please do feel free to do that. It's going to cut your learning curve down by what forever, right? Because if you never find out why, then you're going to always be doing trial and error. So it will save you at least six months to a year. So you can run that. It's called the stress hormones, mood and metabolism test. You can find any lab I mentioned. We open source all of our labs at stephencabral.com forward slash labs. But let's say that you are high testosterone, high cortisol. That's that's fairly normal with, normal with PCOS, fairly normal, and a lot with pizza-based women as well. So let's look at this. And this can go for guys as well. It's not just women with PCOS. It can go for guys with higher levels of testosterone. And, and they can have their own issues. So they can have higher levels of aggression. They can have higher levels of hair loss. Um, they can have more stress, poor sleep, et cetera. Now, there are benefits to high testosterone, but there's also the downsides, right? What are the benefits? Well, more ambition, more drive, higher libido, uh, lead, typical leader, like person who's at the front of the pack. And so, like, there's pros and cons, but the cons can be fairly negative, meaning, like, for women, uh, additional, like, there can be facial hair growth, there can be acne, there can be anxiety, there can be... Uh, poor mood, there can be more irritability, there can be sleep loss, uh, there can be more inflammation, and all sorts of dysregularity in menstrual cycle as well. So what we're looking at is then, well, what forms of exercise then would exacerbate higher testosterone and higher cortisol? Because that's the first thing you want to ask yourself. So again, I'm trying to work through this as if I would be teaching someone in my practice like face-to-face -face, or even our IHPs. Because you, you have to peel back the onion. And that's what we don't do is everybody sticks to like their specific dogma and they won't tell you like what are the underlying root causes? Okay, well, let's work through this as an actual problem. That's, that's how you want to look at natural health is that there's a problem and there's always a reason why. So there can be multiple reasons why. Let's say, again, we just learned this person has high cortisol and high testosterone in a PCOS-based course, uh, and, or maybe they have higher levels of estrogen as well, because testosterone higher is leading to higher levels of estrogen. All right, let's work with that. So, and in men, that can also uh, affect prostate inflammation and breast tissue growth in men. So let's say that man or woman you're dealing with PCOS or side effects of high testosterone in men. So what we don't want to do are exercises or anything in life that's going to exacerbate higher levels of cortisol. Well, what's cortisol? Higher levels of stress, right? So higher levels of stress could be induced by normal things. Sometimes we even think they're good, like fasting, right? Well, fasting is a good thing. It's a really good thing. But when you do too much of it, what do you do? Well, you increase cortisol levels. You can increase cortisol levels, especially if blood sugar levels drop. That's its main job. Again, people forget that the main job of cortisol is as a glucocorticoid. It's literally built in there. Well, what's the gluco part? Well, when your blood sugar levels drop, your body will produce more 
from what's called the adrenal uh, cortex, it will produce more cortisol. The Technically, your brain, your hypothalamus tells your pituitary gland to tell your adrenals what to do, but it's because it's getting the signal that there's dropping blood sugar. Okay, so if there's dropping blood sugar, how does your body keep from passing out? Well, it has to maintain normal blood sugar, okay? So if it does that, it releases more cortisol. And hopefully it releases just the right amount, but oftentimes it's a higher stress in the body because you're not just dealing with lower blood sugar, you might be dealing with getting the kids ready for school or stuck in traffic or giving a presentation at work or even doing a fasted workout. Good for some people, not so good for others. So that's just one example. Well, really hard workouts are another example high intensity interval training or pushing yourself to failure with each set typically will raise cortisol if not overdone and will typically raise testosterone if not overdone, meaning like it will give you a beneficial effect. So a lot of people feel like they get a relief from their allergies or they get a boost in energy when they do their exercise. Yeah, that's true. It's absolutely true. If you don't take it too far, you get a boost in cortisol, you get a boost in norepinephrine, uh, a dopamine, you get a boost in testosterone. That's a good thing, right? Because now that those your natural norepinephrine helps with your inflammatory processes like allergies, et cetera, asthma, but when overdone, obviously it depletes you. So let's think about that. Well, if you're already dealing with high testosterone, high cortisol, and higher levels of estrogen dominance, do you want to do really hard weight training workouts or high intensity interval training workouts? The answer would be no. That would be detrimental to your current dis- ease. That means imbalance of the body, right? The balance in, is not an ease. So what do we do? Do we say those workouts are bad? No, of course they're not bad. We recommend high intensity interval training and weights and, and pushing yourself to failure all the time. Is this recommended for this specific group of people? No, it's not. And that's why we have to understand there's no keto for everyone. There's no whatever diet for everyone. There's no workout for everyone. You understand, is my body balanced? Yes or no. If your body is balanced, then you can get away with a whole lot more, which is why all of these gurus at 22 years old, I used to be one of those people, <laughs> so I totally understand, um, you're looking through the lens of a 22-year-old or 25-year-old personal trainer or nutritionist. You can get away with so much in your 20s. The reason is that you're pretty much balanced. I wasn't, so I learned at a younger age that what, what it feels like to be, you know, 85 years old because my body was completely deteriorated, was completely um, dilapidated, literally is completely broken down. So what am I sharing with you? Well, if you're dealing with higher levels of aggression or testosterone or estrogen dominance or PCOS or high levels of cortisol, you don't want to do activities that would exacerbate that condition until you get it under control, until you get it balanced. So a good PCOS-based workout would be something that involves some cardio which would modulate cortisol levels, modulate stress levels. Stay with me for a moment. I'll talk to you about the weight training for PCOS in just a moment. And here's why. I've given this every single Friday on my podcast. I give you two research studies. One of them I gave you that one of the best ways in order to improve your overall stress resilience was aerobic-based work. Now, I don't love to run. I don't love doing cardio. I would much rather be weight training. That's the truth. I would be much rather doing sandbag workouts, uh, battling ropes. I'd be swinging a steel mace. I would be, you know, climbing a rope like anything, flipping tires. Like I'd rather do those types of workouts. I enjoy that. I don't enjoy going for a jog. I don't mind walking. I like to walk. But here's the deal: the science is, has always been really positive on aerobic-based exercise unless you overdo it. So people are like, no, aerobic is terrible. It creates micro tears in the heart. Yeah, if you're doing marathons, yes. But there's somewhere between jogging for a mile or two and 26 miles, right? There's a little bit of difference between those two. We just like to overdo everything in our Western-based mindset. So you doing 20 or 30 minutes of cardio is a good thing. You build up over time. Now, again, if you're not doing any cardio, you just start with walking. You literally just walk up to seven to 10,000 steps per day and you ease into it. That will build up your overall stress resilience. That's a good thing. And it also helps with weight loss because one of the major factors with PCOS is usually some type of, um, we call it toxic water weight, water retention from inflammation, or it could be adipose tissue increase, so fat gain. So we want to look at that 
walking tremendous, some light jogging tremendous, or light any type of aerobics tremendous. Uh, if you find yourself more than 30, 50 pounds overweight, you may not want to start with jogging. It's probably not great on your joints. You might want to do something uh, like the upright bike. You might want to, uh, and I'll be talking about that, I think, more tomorrow. You might want to do even a rowing machine. Like you can do an elliptical if you want. Elliptical is not my favorite, that's for sure. But um, you can start there, right? It's a place to start. You always start with where you're at. Now, in terms of weight training for PCOS or higher testosterone, nothing wrong with that. You can still do it. What you don't want to do, though, is a high-intensity interval training, excuse me, or push yourself to failure, meaning like last rep, squeezing out, grinding out that last one. Why? That's where you're going to, yes, you'll get a ton of benefits. There's no no doubt about it. But right now, that's not what your body wants. Right now, your body's not looking to produce, or you don't most likely want for your body to produce higher levels of androgens, right? Higher levels of testosterone, maybe even DHEA and higher levels of cortisol because you're going to imbalance your blood sugar to an even greater degree because blood sugar, I didn't mention that earlier, is one of factor in for PCOS as well. So let's let's take it back. What do we want to do? Well, we want to do aerobic-based cardio a couple days a week. We want to do walking every day. And when you do your aerobic cardio, that can count as some of your walking, your seven to 10,000 steps per day. Then what do you want to do for weight training? Well, weight training two to three times a week. What does your weight training look like? Well, it probably looks more like what I talked about last Thursday, which is metabolic conditioning workouts, Metcon workouts. So if you didn't check that out, that was actually two weeks ago in episode 2302. So just head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 2302. If you want to learn more about PCOS, go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast. Just type in PCOS. Um, certainly can chat with you more about that. Reason why I'm talking about it a little bit more, one out of 10 women are going to suffer from PCOS-based symptoms. Um, and I want to be able to help to a greater degree. We see it so much in our practice. So if you're doing a lighter weight space workout, that does not mean pick up light weights. It just means like you're not going to failure. Uh, and you can do it circuit-based style. You're going to get the best of all worlds. Some lighter aerobic cardio, some lighter weight-based training. That just means not high intensity. It doesn't mean light weights, not just higher, not higher intensity. And then you're going to be able to repair your body based on what you found, whether it's blood sugar, vitamin D, thyroid, estrogen, testosterone, like cortisol, you're going to be able to figure it out. Once you figure out your body's balance, then you're going to ease into what? Well, you're going to ease into probably just a little bit more weight training if that's what you choose to do, or maybe you found your sweet spot for your body, and that's exactly what you're going to look at. So hopefully this was helpful. Again, I'm going to do more follow-up shows on PCOS. We've got a lot of requests. I want to be able to demystify this. I just want you to know there's always an answer. There really is. You're able to test for that under uh, underlying answer. Then you're able to customize a protocol built based on your imbalances. So again, if this show was helpful, please do feel free to share it with anyone else you believe it could serve. And I'll be back tomorrow on another Cabral Concepts.